God is amazing. I'd like to welcome everybody back out on the internet. Praise the Lamb. God has blessed us and we're going to be back facing our ministry messages back to the world. Amen. Amen. Let's come together and join ourselves in a prayer of agreement. Father, <clears throat> we thank you for the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's taking place in these last days. Thank you that the Spirit of the living God is setting captives free. Thank you, Father, that in the middle of darkness and gross darkness covering the people and darkness covering the land, that your glory will be seen upon your church. That your glory will be seen upon your people. That your resurrection power will shine upon the children of the covenant in these last days. Father, we thank you that no matter what people do on our left or on our right, by your grace, we will stand. No matter what happens in the world, your word is true. Your word never fails. Your covenant will be established in the people of faith. That demons will be cast out. Yes. Blind eyes will be opened. Deaf ears will be opened. The lame will walk. The tangled tongues will be set free to praise the name of Jesus Christ. And Father God, right now, though the heathen rage, the glory, the glory of the Lord will cover the earth. The whole earth, all the earth will see the glory of the living God. By the glorious name of Jesus Christ, and all the people of God said, Amen. 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 I want to speak for a few minutes today. Well, I'm not going to speak. Hopefully the Holy Spirit will do the speaking today. Amen. Amen. If it's not the Spirit, then we're just full of hot air and wasting our time. But thank God this is a place where the Spirit of God lives. Amen. This is holy ground. This is miracle ground. This is prophetic. Amen. How, how, how many of you realize that the scripture was being fulfilled today in this church, on this holy site, according to the word? It said in the last days that the reapers will overtake the plowmen. What that's saying is as they're sowing seed, instead of the normal time of cultivation and germination, of the seed to break up, spring forth, and then months later, the harvesters come in. It says in the last day, as soon as the sowers cast the seed into the soil, the harvesters are right behind it. What's that mean? God's going to do a quick work. Look at somebody say, no matter what it's looked like in the past, God's going to do a miracle quick work. Do a miracle, quick now listen to me. He's going to do a miracle quick work in the desires of your heart. He's going to do a miracle quick work in your faith goals. Those things that God has put inside you. That you've longed for. That you've cried out for. That you've literally fasted and travailed and, and wept tears for. God's going to do a quick work on it. The evidence of that was the prophetic utterance this, this morning in prayer. As we were interceding, the Spirit of God came on me. And what did God say? It's going to be as the days of the dragnet. You'll cast the net. My Spirit will bring them in. And I'll bring in all manner of a sundry fish. Some of them will shock you. Some of them will not be what you were fishing for. But the Holy Spirit will sort them out. Listen to me, world. Preach the gospel, men and women of God. Preach the uncompromised word of God. God will pull the net. And he's going to do a quick work. By the time it came out of this man God's mouth, we saw a manifest on his holy ground. 
Just that we weren't looking for, but God's heart was seeking out. Amen? Amen? Now let the Holy Spirit sort out what kind of fish stay in the boat and what doesn't. He'll take care of all that. Amen? Amen. All you got to do is pray, prophesy, confess, and believe. And God will do the work. Amen? Amen? Amen. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now I want to say that in these days, listen to this man of God very closely. God has begun to speak prophetic utterance to me as of the very hour of the last Supreme Court decision. Our country, our nation, our government has set its jaw like flint against the Holy God. Do you hear me? They used to say this a few years back, and it used to just grab me by the gut. Men would stand in the pulpit and say, America's no longer a Christian nation. And the first thing that came out of this president when he was in the White House is, America's no longer a Christian nation. That was the first government declaration for leadership in this nation, when the Spirit of God made me understand completely, this is no longer a Christian-based nation. Our government has officially turned its back on God. And has made decision after decision after decision saying no to God and yes to the forces of hell. We are in the last hour of the last day. Somebody say amen. 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 When men and women of God will rise up and do great exploits and confirm the word of God with God working with us with signs following. If you've never believed this Pentecostal stuff, if you've never believed this Holy Ghost stuff, if you always thought this tongues and this, I've had them laugh at me. Oh, you believe in laying on of hands? Yes, I do. And if you've never believed it before, listen to me. Whether you like it or not, the days are upon you when you're going to see it happen all around. Because even though the people of God, in one form, may be drawing back, backsliding, and running away from the battle. There's a remnant that we even prayed about this morning that are going to rise up in the flame of God, the holy fire of God, the holy presence of the Spirit of the living God, and do great and mighty spirit works. Amen. The Holy Spirit is going to walk with men and women in this hour with miracles, signs, and wonders that the human eye has never seen. Amen. Now let me say this to you. Miracles, we understand. Signs we understand. What's a wonder? A wonder is this. Listen very closely. A wonder is such a radical manifestation of God. So holy and so obviously supernatural that even believers stand and wonder, my God, how did this happen? I've never seen anything like this before. Amen. That even believers wonder and marvel at what took place in front of their eyes. I'm telling you as a man of God, you're in the days of signs and wonders. If you have a heart for God, you will rise up and God will confirm this word that others have mocked, that other, others have doubted, that others have disbelieved, that others have even set their jaw against. And he's going to confirm it with such radical manifestations it's going to make a lot of Christians wonder what's happening. Amen. Amen? Amen. So I got news for you, church. I got news for you, brothers and sisters, that have, that have mocked and been cold in your heart, that have drawn away and embraced the ways of the world, that have said, that's too radical and you need to be progressive, that that's old and antiquated and outdated and God's got to become progressive and relevant to this generation, I got news for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, God is God. His word is true. No matter if every man and woman on earth are liars, God is true. And God's about to prove that in the marketplace, in the business place, in the streets, in the highways, in the hedges, in the back alleys, and in your living room. 
you're going to be wondering why did I not choose to believe when I had a chance. Amen. And those that look like they would never come out of darkness are going to come out into the glorious light of the kingdom of God's dear Son. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The days are now. Hallelujah. The hour is now. The power of God is being revealed now. The glory of the Lord in the darkest hour of America and the darkest hour of the world will be seen upon you if you choose to believe and walk closer with Him than you ever have before in your life. Make the decision. Sell out to God. Pursue the things of the Lord. Go deep into the Spirit and watch God confirm His Word with signs, wonders, and miracles. Amen? Amen. Amen. These are the days of great faith. These are the days when everything that we've said that we believe is going to take place. When the people around you figure it's all over, there's nothing God can do, that's when God can do everything. And that's when you've got to know who you believe, what you believe, and be able to dwell in it like Pastor Darling was preaching earlier. That you, you live in His presence. And He lives constantly in you. No matter what, listen, no matter what's going on around you. The days of being able to sit in your living room and have pity parties and then think you're going to walk by faith the next day those are over. You've got to live in the presence of God. When all your relatives think you're crazy, you got to live in the presence of God. When everybody around you thinks you're, you're over the edge, you got to live in the presence of God. Where nothing that you have trusted in looks like it's working, you got to live in the presence of God. When your kids are going nuts, you got to live in the presence of God. When your family looks like it'll never survive, you got to live in the presence of God. When the economy looks like it's never going to last long enough, you got to live in you, you, It's not a thing of luxury where you can sit and doubt and disbelieve and cry and have pity parties and then think you're walking by faith. You've got to stay in the presence of God and stay in the things that you say you believe in. Yes, amen. Amen? amen. Amen? Somebody say hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Amen. How many of you consider yourself people of faith? Amen. You know what faith is? Just, just focus on me, brother. You know what faith is? Walking what the Word says no matter what's going on around you. You know what faith is? Walking confident that you're blessed of the Lord when everything around you says you're not blessed at all. Huh. You know what the word says? It said that you and your family will be saved, and you've got to walk confident and at peace in that when everybody around you looks like they're going to hell. Amen. Faith is walking what this Bible says when everything in your body, everything in your life, says the opposite. That's faith. Faith says that me and my household will be saved. And you may get up in the morning and look at your kids and they're doing everything but happy to save. You may get up in the morning and, and your husband's talking everything but a saved man. You may come home from work and your wife's saying stuff everything but what a saved person would say. He said, and you got to stay in the presence of God and believe every bit of this word. Amen. This word says that you're blessed in your field. Nowadays, I would be, I'm blessed where I work. Even though you go to work and everybody around you, Sister Teresa's trying to get you fired. You walk through that already. You got to stay in the spirit and keep believing this to assure steadfast calm assurance when all the fires of hell are saying opposite of what you believe in. When everything looks opposite of what God has promised you, you've got to stay in the presence of Christ, in the Word, in faith. Those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Your heart's really got to be in it. You're going to find out real quick a lot of faith people that, oh, I believe the word, don't believe very much at all. Somebody say amen. Amen. 
you're going to find out that even so-called word of faith people that have been quoting and toting for years really have not believed much at all. Because, child of God, let me tell you something. It's not what you say in totality. It's what you can walk out after you say it. It's what you confess and possess that's real. Faith without works is dead. Dead words without your heart really having faith in it will produce nothing. And you're going to find out a lot of so-called faith people didn't have much faith at all. Because what they see will be so much more drastic than what they claim they believe. I got news for you right now. It doesn't matter what happens in Egypt. It doesn't matter what happens in Babylon. You're a child of covenant. You're a child of the promises of God. You're a child of Goshen. You're a child of the blood covenant. Though the fire of, of God falls out of the sky, so the fires of hell rise up out of the earth and start to consume everything around you. It will not come nigh thy dwelling. Amen. You've got to believe that now. You gotta have that so strong inside of you that no matter how hot the fire gets, you believe it. Okay. Bill, sit down. You gotta be so strong in faith, folks. For the camera, that's just a, a man has come in and God delivered straight off the streets today. So praise God. <laughs> Prophecy, prophecy, prophecy fulfilled before he even stopped praying. Now we're going to look very quickly this, this uh, morning at protecting and keeping strong faith. Protecting and keeping strong faith. How many of you here last Sunday? We cover some basic foundational scriptures that will change your life if you get them deep inside your heart. Amen? Amen. Last Sunday, we looked at some very, very basic Bible principles that will revolutionize your entire life if you get them down in your heart. I'd like for you to open up with, with me to Romans chapter 10. Romans Chapter 10. Hallelujah. 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 How do we get strong faith? How do we keep it? How do we protect it? How many of you know that you don't stay strong on your own? How many of you know that you don't stay encouraged on your own? How many of you know you don't stay, ex listen, you don't stay excited on your own? Amen? The Word of God is very clear. It gives us very sure instructions on things to do, principles to adhere to, practices, godly practices, godly practices that we need to apply to stay strong in the ways and the things of God. Amen? Amen. So first of all, we got to look at Romans chapter 10. Very, now, we're going to look at some scriptures that's very, very, very common, very well known. But let me tell you something. What did I just say by the Spirit of God? Many people that claim that they're word of faith people, that they have faith, we're going to find out really don't have much faith at all. Amen? Yeah. I hope you're getting this. You know how you're going to find it out? In the heat of battle. Let me say that again. You know how you're going to find this out? In the heat of spiritual battle. In the heat of things of their natural lives turning upside down, even though they're claiming they're praying. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, folks, I am word of faith. I love the, I am, I love the word. I am sold out on the word of faith. I'm radically word of faith. 
But I've been doing this long enough to realize that there's a big gap between what people say they believe and what people are able to live. It's not what you talk that destroys the kingdoms of darkness. It's what you walk that destroys the kingdoms of darkness. It's not what you just claim. Listen, why do we name it and claim it? Because the Bible says you will have what you say. Now, if you're going to change anything in your life, you've got to find the promise of God that applies to your need. You can't just say, God's going to change my finances because I don't like being broke. Well, what scripture is that? God hastens to confirm his word, not your babblings. God moves quickly to establish what he has put down in print as a holy covenant, as a written contract. God not only honors that and moves because of that, but the Word of God says that he, he moves quickly to confirm, establish, and perform His Word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let me say that one more time. How do I get God to move in the affairs of my life? Speak it out. Ask for it. Faith. Receive it. Word. Absolutely, but we're still jumping ahead of what we just tried to get clear. How do I get God to move quickly in the desires of my life? Teresa? Find the scripture that lines up with you got to find His Word on what you're dealing with. God will always do what God's promised to do. He'll never break a promise. And He wrote every promise in writing. So if you have a desire, you have to find a Scripture that applies specifically to your desire, to your need, to the issues in your life at that time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at somebody say, I've got to live in the Word. I've got to live in the Word. i got to find answers to my life in the Word. i find answers to my life in the Word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at somebody say, you may be my friend, but if you're not telling me the Word, you're just talking. May be my friend if you're not telling me the word. Just talk about you're just moving your lips. Amen. You're not doing me no good at all. Amen. Now, when you speak the word of God to me, now you're releasing the blessings and the force and the power of the covenant of Almighty God into my life. So, if I want God to move quickly, I mean, anybody serious about their life changing now? Amen. Amen. How many of you know He's so close to the door? We don't have some time later to live for. We need answers and Bible answers and Bible miracles now so that we can be built up and established in our faith so that we can take that faith and set captives free. Time is short and God wants to move quickly. God said, I will hasten, I will move quickly to confirm my word, find his word. Find his word. You want God to move fast? Find His Word. Find what His Word says about what you're wrestling with. Then once you know what His Word says, He, he said, I will do it if you believe. You know, I'm going I'm to say this. Please don't be offended out there at YouTube land. I've even had people very close to me say, you, you're just too hard. Other preachers make me feel good. I listen to you. You, you, you make, you, you're too hard. Okay. Now when you're attending your daddy's funeral, tell me how gentle the devil feels. When you're attending your brother's or sister's funeral, tell me how the sweet-talking preachers build your faith. When everything in your life is dying and falling apart, tell me how powerful feel-good is working for you. You know, I never appreciated my Marine Corps drill instructors until I had to fight. I never appreciated my my command instructors at the police academy until I had to chase down a bad person and wrestle him and fight him into custody. Then all that discipline, all that not niceness that they treated me with, all that harshness that they instructed me with, all that discipline that they demanded kept me alive and was made me able to bring lawless ones 
into submission. Your sila, think about that in the spirit. How about the devil stop picking on me? Me blowing kisses to you won't stop the devil. It's the word that you know, the word that you stand on, and the word that you exercise as a mature son and daughter of God in the force of faith that drives back the forces of hell and subdues them into obedience to the laws of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What's the moral of that story, Pastor? I'm not here to blow kisses to you. I'm here to interject faith into you and build you up in your most holy faith so that you can walk by faith and not fall when the enemy attacks you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you want quick change in your life? God wants to move quickly in your life. And he will hasten quickly. He will quickly respond to his word. Why? Because he's going to make sure that he never breaks his promise to you if you believe it. Well, God's not moving very fast. Number one, you're not standing on the words of God. You're standing on hoping and wishing. Somebody say, I'm glad I came. I'm glad I came. Faith is not hoping. Faith is not wishing. Faith is knowing that this word is final authority. This is the word of God Almighty. And God will not let it fall to the ground if I truly believe it. I don't wish God does something. I know God does stuff. I don't hope God's going to move. I know God's going to move. Why? Because he promised he would. Well, how do I know he promised it? Because he wrote it down. Number one, you've got to establish this in your hearts, child of God. This is the final authority. This is actually the word of God Almighty. There is no higher opinion above this. There is no higher authority above this. This is God's word, written in contractual form, and it is binding in my life. And if this is not the highest authority, it's no authority at all. As long as your friend's opinion can override this, God has no authority in your life. As long as mom and dad's opinion can override this, God has, God's not even God in your life. As long as the boss can override this, there's no authority of God in your life. This has to be highest authority. What's one of the titles of God? The most high. There's people that ride high. There's people that live high. There's people that exalt themselves high. But there is only one most high. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he happens to be your father. Amen. That should get you excited right there. Well, you, you think you're all that. You're, you're all high and mighty. My daddy's the most high. Now see, if you don't believe that, you'll never live that high. If you don't absolutely, totally, 100% in your heart believe that, you'll never bring everything that tries to raise itself highly above you underneath your feet. Amen. Until you make this word final authority. This is the highest wisdom, the highest power, the highest dominion, the highest authority of everything, you'll never depend on it. You'll always trust in something else. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory to God. Did you get that? Yeah. Listen, somebody comes up and says, Brother Tony, now this is never going to happen because he's a covenant man. He's washed by the blood. He's saved in the name of Jesus. He's a blood-bought, Holy Ghost-filled, sanctified son of the living God. Amen? Yes, so it's never going to happen. This is strictly an analogy. Somebody says, Tony, that, that bump on your face is not normal. You need to go get that checked out. How many of you, of you have had people say, you feel okay? Because they're seeing something you didn't see in the mirror. They think they're seeing something you didn't see. Let me, let me, let me, listen, listen. The devil will always try to get your attention. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why he roars. That's why he rages. That's why he blows. That's why he turns up the, the waves. That's why he causes all manner of disruption. To get your attention. Attention on what? Away from your God and his word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Glory to God. So somebody comes up to Tony and says, Tony, that bump on your face don't look right. You better go get that check. Now, Tony's a word of a word of faith man. First of all, it's not going to work with Tony, but we're just assuming for teaching purposes that Tony's the average Christian. How many of you know Tony's not average? Tony's exceptional in every category. Well, how can you say that? Well, the Bible says he is. Hello. I'm talking reality. Now, does, does Pastor TC always act like Jesus around Darlene? Well, you people are hard. Somebody should have said yes by faith. <laughs> Absolutely not. But does that give Darlene the, cup, the right to speak against what God has started in my life? And if she does, she's not walking by faith. She's being moved by what she sees out of me, hears out of me. Just because Satan's raging through somebody or around somebody doesn't give you the right because you know him to change the covenant God spoke over him. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Look at something say, time to watch my mouth. Time to watch my mouth. Hallelujah. We're going to look at that in just a minute. Look at somebody on the other side and say, I'm glad I came. Praise God. I'm glad I came. Praise God. Amen? Amen. So Tony, Tony, being an average Christian, says, goes to the nearest mirror and starts looking for the bump. Well, I, he didn't see it when he shaved, hasn't felt it all day, but Satan brought a good, loving, concerned Christian brother to point out something that might happen. Planted the seed of doubt and unbelief to bring force of, and put faith in the springing up of the curse. Tony didn't notice it when he shaved. Tony hasn't felt it all day. Now Tony's looking for it to agree with it. Oh, there it is. Well, wow. Yeah, yeah I, I can feel it. And, and, well, it is a little tender. And, and nothing more than a pimple, but now we better go get a check. Now his footsteps are ordered by doubt and unbelief. Clear to the point it's affecting. Well, I got to cancel Marissa. They make an appointment for the doctor. Make sure this is nothing. But you wouldn't be moving if it was nothing. So you've already energized it with faith that it's something. That's not faith at all. Well, what about that bump on your face, Tony? Not concerned with it at all? Didn't notice no bump? Not aware that there's a bump. I walk in divine health. I'm, I'm saved, healed, sanctified, and delivered by the blood of the Lamb. And by, by the way, let me tell you something, brother. Thank you for your concern. But every cell in my body is charged, saturated with the Zoe life of the living God. With divine health by the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. 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 That, that's how you separate real faith from just talk. Thank you, Jesus. Are you getting this? Amen. So you're in the days now where you're going to see people act and behave in ways that you thought were faith people, and you're going to say, "My God, they don't—they didn't really have much faith at all." And you have to be locked so tightly into the things of God that, listen to me, no matter how much people act around you and act out around you. And no matter how much you love them, you don't allow what you see and what you hear to take you off of what you claim you believe. If this is not final authority, you'll be running to the doctor when you don't need to. You'll be seeking counseling when you don't need to. You'll be asking God to save loved ones when you don't need to. You'll be checking your body. You'll be doing everything contrary to what you claim you believe. This has got to be final authority. Now let's go back to Brother Tony, average Christian. He goes to the doctor. He says, Doctor, a friend of mine said there's a bump on my face. I think I feel something. Would you look at it? The doctor's a nice guy, looks at it, says, Well, let's let's take a sample. Starts drilling into Tony's face, pulling out a core of flesh, sends it off to have a biopsy. 
comes back and the results say it could be cancer. Now what's Tony going to do if Tony has any sense? Somebody raise your hands and let's, let's get involved in this word of faith teaching. What's Tony going to do if he has any sense? My God, people, let me tell, let Pastor help you out here. You go to a doctor and believe his report and go by that without getting a second opinion, Satan's going to kill you with no problem. How come we won't even question doctors, but we question everything God says and claim we're faith people? And we seek everybody else's opinion about what God says, but claim we're Christians. It's because this is not final authority. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Tony, if Tony has any sense, he's going to go so get a opinion. second opinion. Why? Because that's he's, he doesn't know that doctor. He hasn't put his full trust and confidence in that doctor. He doesn't have an intimate relationship with that doctor. So he doesn't give him the final authority over his life. Amen. 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 So that drives him to a second opinion. The second opinion, he doesn't know that well. He only heard about him, only made an appointment to see him this one time, has never hung out with him, has no fellowship with him, has no intimate relationship with him. But that second opinion says the same thing. I think it's cancer. What's Tony going to do? Well, at that point, the average person, well, two of them said it, i got to believe it. I've got cancer. I need to be treated. And that's true. Now, TC, we're going to go first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, nineteenth opinion, and I'm still going to doubt what they say. Why? Because I have somebody with a higher authority in my life than their opinion and their diagnosis. See, what, are, what am I trying to say is I'm trying to say this. You, get, you talk to different people because the first person didn't have final authority in your life. And you talk to another person because that person didn't have final authority. And until this becomes final authority, the highest opinion that causes you not to seek any other opinions, you'll always be double-minded and inconsistent in your life. Until this is so final that God's word is God's word, not man's word. God of the universe, he spoke it, he put it in writing, he sealed it with the blood of his son. He promised it with the blood of his son. There's no higher opinion or authority or power to back up that authority. I need confer with no one else. Amen. Look at somebody and tell them the number one cure for instability and double-mindedness is making God's word the word of God. Number one cure for instability and double-mindedness making God's word the word of God, word of God. Final, authority. final authority hallelujah hallelujah hallelujah, hallelujah. you'll stop asking somebody well what do you think after you read it you'll stop asking everybody what do you think after you come up for prayer you'll stop asking everybody how they feel about it when you say from now on I'm going to live this because this is final authority not him her or them Amen? Amen? So number one for strong faith and protecting strong faith is making God's word final authority. Because outside of God's word, there is no faith. Amen. Listen to me. Every other opinion outside of God's word is a seed of doubt. It's a question mark whether God's telling the truth or not. If I read it and have to ask Tony what he thinks about it, that means I'm not fully convinced that what he says is going to plant a question mark in my spirit. Unless it's absolutely in agreement with the Lord God. And I'm going to tell you right now, listen, I love folk. I love people. I love folk. Amen? But you're not God. I value you. But unless you're telling me exactly what the Bible says, you're dangerous around me. Anybody want to live victorious? Amen. Anybody want to stand when everybody else in this world right now is getting ready to fall? Amen. Make God's word final authority. Amen? Amen. 
Now Romans 10, 17 says this, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. But let's back up to, to Romans 10, 14. Rom, Romans 10, 14. Are you ready? How then shall they call upon Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them. Listen to this, folks. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How do people get faith to get saved? they got to hear the word of God. How do people get faith to be healed? they got to hear the word of healing. How do people get faith to prosper? they got to hear the word of prosperity. How do people get faith to cast out devils instead of letting devils beat them up? They gotta have faith in the word of deliverance. So until you hear it, faith does not rise up. Hallelujah. And until it's preached, you don't hear anything. Did you hear me? You know what that means? Faith cometh by hearing. Until you open your mouth, nothing's heard. And until the word of God is heard, faith is not released. And until faith is released, nobody gets saved, nobody gets healed, nobody gets delivered, no devils are cast out, nothing changes. Why is all hell coming around you? Because people have stopped preaching the word of God. Why has the demonic forces gotten stronger around children of God. Because people have stopped boldly rising up and saying, Thus saith the Lord. Amen. Did you hear me? Yes. Political correctness is killing your victory. Social acceptance is killing your victory. Did you hear me? Yes. Faith cometh by hearing. Faith cometh by hearing. Faith cometh by hearing. You know what that means? You need to open your mouth. You need to open your mouth. I'm going to give you another clue, folks. Listen very closely. Stay in the Word of God. If faith cometh by hearing, read the Word, read the Word, read the Word. Speak the word, speak the word, speak the word. Print the word and paste the word on your walls and on your mirrors, on your refrigerators, on your headboards, everywhere you have to look, on the drawers of your dresser. Put the word of God before your eyes and don't just glance at it and forget it like it's wall decoration. Train yourself that every time you see a scripture before you, you stop, read it, and say, it's mine. That's why God said, write it on the doorpost of your heart. Put it on your front gate. Put it before your eyes. Meditate in it day and night. It's got to be before you. You've got to live in the Word. You've got to live in Jesus. You've got to dwell in Him constantly. And the more you live in it, the more you speak it, the more you confess Him, the more your faith is grown and grown and grown and grown. Faith cometh by hearing. You want strong faith? Live in the Word. You want strong faith? Speak the word. You want strong faith? Listen to the word. Well, how much, Pastor? Until you're so strong in faith, no weapon of hell stops you anymore. Church was never meant for an hour word of word being preached to you to last all week. Church was meant to teach you how to become disciples and servants of God, men and women of the Most High ultimately fulfilling the purpose of God in your life. Church is meant to teach you to become what you were created to be. 
And you cannot do that without a constant lifestyle of training. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. The more faith you want, the more word you need to hear. You know what time Pastor Darlene went to bed last night? 1.30. You know what she was doing? Listening to the word. You know what she was doing when she fell asleep? She's got one of those pads, but hers is a little smaller. And it's kind of not romantic, but it's okay. I can unplug her when I want to. <laughs> well, let's keep it sanctified, Pastor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Every night, Pastor Darlene's laying in bed, got her pad on her chest and her earplugs in her ears, and she's listening to the teaching of the Word of God, even in her sleep. Because your spirit never goes to sleep. She was listening to the word with me for hours, went to bed with the word plugged into her ears, slept all night with the word being spoken and taught to her spirit man while she's asleep. Got up, first thing she heard was the word of God being preached to her spirit man. What's that mean? She wants strong faith. How strong a faith? She wants walking on the back of every devil of hell thing. However you want to be in the Lord is his indicator on how much you need to hear the word of God. That's number one. How do I how do I get and keep strong faith? Listen to the word of God and keep listening to the word of God. Listen to the word of God, read the word of God, and speak the word of God to yourself. Listen to the word of God, read the word of God, pray the word of God, put the word of God under refrigerators, put the Word of God on your doorposts, put the Word of God on your dressers, put the Word of God on the mirrors, and speak it to yourself all day long, in every circumstance in life, in every situation that pops up during the day. Speak the Word of God to you and through you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now folks, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If every time I walked into a room, I had a barbell, and I had a barbell in every room, in my front porch, back porch, backyard, front yard, in my car. Anybody see that movie, Over the Top, with Sylvester Stallone? He's a truck driver that used to do arm wrestling. And what did he have in his truck while well, he's driving down the road? Weight. Weight pulleys in the cab of his truck. Even while he's driving, he's lifting weights and practicing arm wrestling. Now, if every room I went into, I grabbed the barbell and did five quick curls. Went in the other room, grabbed the barbell, did five, or just two quick curls. Went out in the backyard. Everywhere I went, I just grabbed the weight and did two quick curls. All day long, in every room, in every circumstance, I, I pulled the weight. How strong would I get? How long would it take me to increase my strength? How long? Just very, very quickly compared to the guy that makes an appointment to go to the gym twice a week or three times a week. So if I put the word in every wall, in every mirror, in every room, and I read it every time I go in a room out loud to myself, how long is it going to take me to get my faith starting to build up, boil up, and strengthen up inside of me? Not long at all. But if I wait Sunday to Sunday, how long is it going to take? So what's number one key to developing and keeping my faith strong? The word, the word, the word, the word, the word. Read it, pray it, listen to it. Read it, pray it, listen to it. Read it, pray it, listen to it. Amen? Somebody say hallelujah, Pastor. Hallelujah. Glory, to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Number one, getting faith comes by hearing the word. The more faith you want, study the word, pray the word, listen to the word. Amen? Say it with me. The more faith I want, study the word, pray the word, listen to the word. Let's say it again like you're Pentecostal. Study the word, pray the word, listen to the word. Amen? The word produces faith. I always ask for on faith, give the word. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Matthew 9, 23. 
Matthew 9, 23. How many of you here last week when I ministered on Bill? We have a new Bill. Isn't God amazing? You weren't here earlier. Bill literally came in. A Hindu Bill. Right after we prayed. And you know what this Hindu Bill did? The same thing my original Bill did 35 years ago. He sat there with his head on my shoulder and cried. You guys missed it. Am I exaggerating? Isn't that exactly what we I preached on last week? God is absolutely wonderful. Amen? So everything Pastor C.C. preaches to you can be lived out and is being manifested. Quickly. Hallelujah. Matthew 9, 23. Very, very, very. Now, we're not going to get all the way through this teaching today, obviously. But we're going to get it started real good, and we're going to carry on with it next week. Amen? Look at somebody say, I'm sick and tired of being weak. I want to be strong in the Lord. I want to walk on devils. I'm tired of devils picking on me. I'm tired of being under the circumstances. I want to live above the circumstances. Amen. Amen. This is exactly how you do it. This is exactly how Pastor TC developed it and is still developing it. This is exactly how you're going to develop it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Matthew 9, 23. And when Jesus was coming to the ruler's house and saw... Now, here's, here's what happened. Let me back up. A rich ruler comes to Jesus and said, Lord, I need you to pray for my daughter who has died. And Jesus said, okay, he starts, starts to go pray with him about his daughter. And the woman with the issue of blood stops him. Touches the hem of his garment, gets healed. The ruler's daughter is dead now. Amen? Jesus said, be not afraid, only believe. Now the, the girl's already dead. But the man's hoping for a miracle. So when Jesus gets to the man's house... Back in, the, back in the old days, the Hebrew days, they hired professional mourners. They still do it in some countries. You know what that is? That's people that go around, their job is to, to weep at funerals. And they'd hire people to show up at the funerals and be all emotional and sad like the person that would, they were really, the world was going to miss this person that died. And so when Jesus showed up, all these professional weepers and mourners and funeral goers are already there. There's a great teaching there that I don't have time to go into, but there's people that make a living off of your pain. There's a people whose livelihood is sustained by the misery you're going through. I'll teach you that some other time. We don't have time to go there. Man, you know that's true. Amen? And there's also demons whose life flow is sucking the joy out of you. And the more misery you go through, the happier and healthier they get. Look at somebody say, there is no pity in hell. And nothing gets better just because I look miserable. Would you say it louder like you're Pentecostal? Nothing gets better just because you train yourself to look miserable. Well, if I look sad enough long enough, the devil will leave me alone. No, he'll suck you till you're dead. There's entire industries that make billions and trillions of dollars off your suffering. It's called Big Pharma, large major pharmaceutical corporations that make billions off of every pill they invent. And then teach you, then teach you that you need to spend your money on stuff that you don't need. How many of you ever saw these commercials? Guy comes out, opens up his umbrella, it's raining outside, he goes, it's diarrhea season. 
you need to take these pills. And you know what? People laugh at that, but they'll run out and get those pills because it's raining outside. You have no idea how much the forces of hell make a living off of your suffering. That's what was going here. They got professional mourners. People that make a living off the suffering of those that have lost loved ones. You don't believe it? Go to a funeral home. Well, here's here's our casket for ten thousand dollars. But he meant so much to you. Surely you want to bury him at the level that you loved him for thirty-five thousand dollars. And they feed off your sorrow and your loss. When if you'd stop for a second, stay in the word, he ain't there. He's up there. That's no more meaningful than the last shirt I wore. Burn it in the trash can. I don't care. I'm not in it. It's a shirt. Makes no more sense than going in my closet looking at this jacket and saying, Woo hoo hoo! DC, I miss you. You're talking to a jacket. That's not me. Oh, surely it should be hung on a $5,000 clothes hanger. No. It shouldn't be hung on a plastic clothes hanger. He's gone. Throw the stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. i tell you right now, if the Lord tarries and I get cold home, if you can fit me in a coffee can, do it, praise God. I could care less. Give the case to Darlene. <laughs> she, she, she said, hey man, I got the most Pentecostal out of her. <laughs> Throw them in the ditch, give me the cash, hallelujah. And the truth is, you're not throwing me in the ditch. You're throwing my old earth suit in the ditch. Big deal. Hallelujah. Well, that's a little bit of a rabbit trail, but good preaching anyway, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right, now let's speed up. Verse 23, here comes Jesus to the man's house. His daughter's already dead. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the musicians, professional mourners, playing sad music, and bring a tear to your eye so that every time you hear music, you cry. <coughs> Hallelujah. Saw the musicians and the people making a noise. And he said to them, give place for the... Maid is not dead. Now what's their response? This is God's opinion on the situation. Her dad said she's dead. Her mama's in there. She's dead. Her relatives are in there. She's dead. Her, the professional mourners are all singing. She's dead. And God said, she ain't dead. That's final authority, my friend. Did you get that? Yes. Everybody thinks Brandon's goofy. Brandon dresses goofy. Brandon smells goofy. Brandon walks goofy. God says he's more than a conqueror. Amen. That's faith in final authority. And your faith in the final authority will bring you to exactly what the final authority has said. Oh, hallelujah. Now, if they wouldn't listen to everybody's opinion except Jesus, she had stayed dead and gotten buried. Better listen to this. Better listen to this. Jesus came in and spoke contrary to what every eye agreed with, what every lip agreed with, what every word agreed with, and what every heart agreed with. Jesus spoke against it and got the absolute, absolute Opposite of what everybody was expecting. Final authority. But it didn't just happen. He had to do something to keep that faith strong so that that faith could work in complete opposite of what every doubting heart was expecting. My God, that's good teaching, Holy Ghost. So right now, everything in your life looks opposite of what your heart's crying out for. What you need is faith in the final authority of God's Word. And faith in the final authority of God's Word will 
still work exactly what God said, though everything and everybody around you is agreeing with the opposite. Amen. You're never going to be anything. You're never going to amount to anything. You're never going to have no money. You're never going to be pretty. You're never going to be able to do this. But the Word of God says, greater is He that is in you Amen. than He is anybody else's opinion coming at you. Amen. Look at somebody say, God's for me. God's for me. Who could possibly be against me? Who can be against me? Faith in the final authority will refer to what's obvious in everybody's opinion around you. Hallelujah. Are you ready? Hallelujah. We'll wrap it up with this. Are you ready? Amen. You know what Paul said? Ship's sinking. They've thrown everything overboard. They haven't seen daylight for 15 days. They're starving. No food on the ship. The worst storm is a demonic storm called a Rockladon. A demon was in the middle of it. They'd thrown everything out of the boat, sacrificed everything they owned, and it still didn't get any work any better. The storm was worse. And Paul said this, Be of good cheer, for the angel of the Lord has appeared to me, and I believe God. Now look at me. I didn't say everything in your life is good and rosy right now, did I? I didn't say that everything in your life, look, please get this. Don't let the devil spill it. I did not say that everything in your life is easy. I never said, except Jesus and all the bad things go away. That's a lie from hell. Every demon of hell comes immediately to try to steal the seed out of your heart before it ever grows up. Why? Because he knows. Faith left alone produces a tree so big, everybody that you meet is blessed from your life. He doesn't want that. So he attacks you immediately when you really get saved. Yeah. Oh, just say this prayer, everything will get better. No, it won't. Say this prayer, and it gives you the platform for everything to get better. But immediately, everything gets worse. Well, why does it get worse? I'm trying to serve God. That's exactly why it's getting worse. Because faith is going to start... Rising up in your heart that puts the kingdom of hell under your feet. So the kingdom of hell has to attack you quick before you really get this stuff deep down inside of you. Amen. And that's why it seems to get easy for a while when you backslide and go back out in the world. All the pressure's on. I'm drinking, having a good time. Everybody likes me. We're partying. I love, this is just fun. I don't have nearly much problem. And then all of a sudden you wake up and you're, you got terminal sickness. Because the wages of sin is death. And the devil will take all the heat off of you while you're playing in his minefield. And let you think it's easier and a lot more fun until you wake up with the manifestation of the curse in your life. You understand the two levels now? Hallelujah. 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 Somebody said, that's good preaching, Holy Ghost. That's good preaching. All right. So Jesus came to the ruler's house, saw the musicians and the people making noise, and he said unto them, give place. Get out of the way. The maid is not dead. Everybody else's opinion said, she's dead. God says, she's not dead. Look at Pastor. You're not going to. You're not going to die. You're not going to be defeated. You're not going to be abused the rest of your life. You're not going to stay broke. You're not going to stay sick. You're not going to be depressed. You're not going to be in fear. You're not going to fail. Amen. The Word of God says you're not. Hallelujah. The Word of God says you're blessed. Hallelujah. The Word of God says you're more than a conqueror. Hallelujah. The Word of God says you're above and not beneath. Yes. The Word of God says you're the lender and not the borrower. Yes. The Word of God says opposite of what this world is trying to suffocate you to death with. Now you got to talk to him and say, get out of the way. Amen. Just like Jesus did. Amen. You invite the devil to leave your house and he'll sit up camp forever. Eat everything in your refrigerator and gripe at you that you didn't restock it for him. Amen. 
Hallelujah. The, de the devil will take and take and take and take and take and gripe and complain at you that you're not supplying more for him to take. Some of you have been living with him, I think. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. The good news is this. You can evict him. You can repossess the land for God's glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can repossess your body for the glory of God. Amen. You can repossess your family for the glory of God. Amen. Satan's moved in and took possession of them. Possession of your stuff. Possession of your joy. Possession of your finances. Repossess it in the written word of God and the authority of the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Drive them out of the land of promise. Where's the land of promise? I mean, where your foot's sitting right now. Glory to God. Jesus said, get out of the way. Make way. She's not dead. But she's asleep. Now look at how they responded. Exactly how a lot of your relatives and friends respond when you say, you know what? I'm serving God from now on. <laughs> You're what? I know you better than that. It won't last a week. They laugh you to scorn. You know what? I'm, I'm serving God. I'm singing in church from now on. Oh, yeah, sure. Ah, You're singing? you got a ministry? It's not going to last a week. That's exactly Satan sends people closest to you to laugh in your face first to get you back off from God's promises. I want you to notice that Jesus was talking to all the professional mourners and the relatives the same way. He didn't show the relatives that didn't believe any more respect than he showed anybody else. That's revelation. You should write that down. Never forget. It. A lot of you giving, a lot of you giving mama and daddy and grandma, and aunt Bessie and uncle Duwop much too much authority and opinion in your life just because they have a title and they're related to you. Jesus, stop preaching and come outside. Your mothers and your brothers and your sisters are waiting on you. And Jesus said, who's my mother and who's my brother and who's my sister? And he looked around in the house to the people that were sitting in his presence and said, behold, my brethren, the ones that do the will of God are my brothers and my sisters. Most of you give giving way, way too much respect to blood relatives that have no respect for the God that saved you. Amen. Oh, thank you, Jesus. That's good. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. This got to be final authority over Bubba and Uncle Bill and Aunt Bessie and your sister and your husband and your wife. This has got to be final authority. Amen. Final authority. Final authority. Jesus walked into the to the guests and walked in among the family and said, Make room and get out. She's not dead. And here's what they said. They laughed him to scorn. I've got an apple pie. I don't want to take the time to dig it out. But they ridiculed him, mocked him, and laughed in his face. Sound like anybody you run into on a daily basis? Now listen to what Jesus said. But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid came back to life, or arose. You know, the, the King James is a little fuzzy on this. In the Amplified it says this, when he forced them out, he kicked their rear ends out of the house. Jesus did. God, the God of love. And I've been accused of close family members of being too hard, preaching to me, and not having love. And Jesus said, you going to laugh at what I'm saying? Grabbed him by the scruff of the neck, opened the door, and threw him out in the front door, out in the front yard, and slammed the door, and then raised the girl to, back to life. He didn't respect their opinion. He didn't respect their mockery. He didn't expect that they were outnumbered uh, uh, you know, we got a whole house that thinks you're crazy. We got to get relevant to this generation because nobody believes what you're preaching, TC. Well, they didn't believe what he preached. And how he dealt with the unbelief 
mocking the faith of God was, listen to me, exactly what you need to write down and never forget. Number one, you want strong faith? Stay in the Word, stay in the Word, stay in the Word. Number two, you want strong faith? Protect the atmosphere of your life. you got to kick some folk out of your house. And I'm not talking literally in every case. Some cases you might. Folks, listen to Pastor. I'm trying to be sweet about this. You gotta, you gotta kick some demon possessed friends out of your life. There's folks you got no business allowing around your house no more. Because all it is is doubt, unbelief, and invitations to sin. Doubt and unbelief and invitations to sin. Doubt and unbelief and invitations to sin. You gotta protect the atmosphere of your life. Get it out of your house. Just like Jesus did. You know what? Get out. You're not still in the seat of God's covenant in my life. You're not still in my victory no more. You're not laughing in the face of what I believe anymore. You're not taking my joy anymore. You're not taking my faith anymore. Get out, devil! Amen. And he couldn't raise her from the dead, and he didn't do a thing until he got them out first. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, listen, when I preach like this, most people start looking at whoever they go to church with. It, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. We wrestle with principalities and powers. You don't need to grab your husband and say, you know what, Pastor said, throw, you, throw your unbelieving rear end out in the backyard. You sleep with the dog till you get right with Jesus. I didn't say that. And don't kick your wife out. Don't kick your kids out. But you look at the devil and you look him square in the face and you say, you are not controlling this household through my husband, through my wife, through my kids, through Aunt Bessie or anybody else. This is a house of God. This is a house of faith. I walk by faith and not by sight. You shut your mouth, devil, and get out of here. And you repossess the blessings of God in your life. You repossess the glory of God in your household. You repossess the joy of the Lord in your heart. You gotta shove some stuff out of your life so that the resurrection power of God can bring back to life what He promised you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You learned something today? Amen. Look at somebody say, I feel like kicking some demons around. Yeah, you gotta keep them. You gotta keep them kicked. You know, I'll tell you what, there's there's a wanted list for a squirrel in my backyard. I'm, he, he's a dead squirrel next time I catch him. And that squirrel, man, that's, I love squirrels. They're so funny. I watch them, but I'm not going to really kill them. But in the spirit, there's a wanted dead or alive for Earl the squirrel. I'm going to get him. Earl's a dead squirrel spiritually. I'm going to grab him. I'm going to take him over the fish pond. We're going to have a baptism. The girl's going to either get right and stay out of my bird seed, or the girl's going to have to go to somebody else's yard and play. He's the funniest squirrel. I caught him laying on the top of my fence, looking up. At, I, this may mean nothing to you, but it's very spiritual to me. Darlene bought one of these bird feeders for me because I love watching birds. It's got the little trap doors on the side, the birds fly up, sit on the thing, and eat, and it's just cool. And she got me another one for hummingbirds. I love hummingbirds. And I'm sitting there, and, I'm, and I screwed a, one of them hooks up underneath the rafters of the house, right where I wanted to so line up on the kitchen table, and we could sit there and drink coffee whenever she gets up for breakfast, or whenever I come home from work. And just, just whenever we could, we'd sit there and watch the birds. And it's so, so so fun. Then look down, here's these cute little goldfish swimming around in the pot. I just got to, man, we're turning our house into the garden of Eden. The blessings of the Lord. What? I looked out there a couple weeks ago, and here's Earl, laying on the bed. Like this. He's got his back leg hanging on one side of his front leg, and he's just staring at the bird feeder like this. I said, you crazy squirrel, get out of here. And he just looks at me. So I open the door, I'm yelling through the window, and he's just looking at me like, what are you going to do about it? Whipping his tail around, just 
dangling his legs like some old drunk up the street. Man, he didn't do that. So I opened the door and said, get out of here, squirrel. He looks up, he goes, <laughs> and goes down the fence like this, right? It didn't scare him at all. Just He just was put out with it. So like about three days later, I looked out the window, and all I see is this little squirrel arm hanging off the, off the roof of the house trying to grab the bird feeder. <laughs> That's all I saw is this one little squirrel arm with his squirrel fingers trying to grab my bird feeder. I go out there, get out of here, Earl! Get away from my bird feeder. Well, Earl got my bird feeder. He ran off, jumped over to the neighbor's house. That little jerk came back when I was at work. Come home, the bird, he figured out how to reach under there, grab that bird feeder and drop it down to the ground, and had chewed on every single place where the bird seed comes out. Big squirrel barks, tore it up. So now I can't feed the birds, and Earl's been repossessed. He's been kicked out. He's depossessed out of my house. See, what am I saying? First you notice the devil just hanging around. You just passively kind of say, well, you can't do that. It doesn't do the job. Then you see him making attempts to steal your joy and attempts to steal your prosperity and attempts to steal the loving relationship between you and your family members and you don't do much about it. And when your back's turned, he's going to get what he's after. Just because you didn't recognize the danger in it immediately doesn't mean it's not out to help kill you. Earl's dead when I catch him. Why? Because what I thought was cute stole from me. You better listen to that. What I thought was no major deal ended up taking what I enjoyed. What I thought really wouldn't happen really did happen. And Satan still constantly comes to steal, kill, and destroy 24 hours a day when your guard's down or not. And what it looks like might be just kind of a game right now really is going to cause you loss. Get with it. And you rebuke him and he will flee. You've got to rebuke him enough that he knows not to come back. Amen? Amen. You learn something, give the Lord a big hand clap.